Arno comes uh, from Sync Cell. It's not the first time that Arno is visiting us. So thank you, Arno, for uh, coming again. And of course, uh, thank you, Sync Cell, for being one of our gold sponsors uh, this year. So Arno is talking about a disaster. Uh, I hope that the disaster is more <laughs> or less something we can survive. So thank you very much, Arno. All right. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> right. So let's see. Um, yeah, so far we've heard a few more high-level things about C++. Um, this time we're going to go to the basics, drill down to the very bare bone of the language. And, uh, and there's a problem there, and that's what I'm going to talk about. I don't know if it's a disaster. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. But you be the judge. All right. So the standard library um, likes value semantics, right? We don't. We are not Java. We are not doing references. We are doing values. And the prime way to be advocated that was the standard library, how it was built. Every container contains values. And then somewhere around past like twenty ten ish. They notice that if you do everything in values, you need to copy a lot. And we wanted to avoid copying. So our value references got invented to avoid copying and replace it by moving. And you probably all know this. So if you have a vector of vectors and you generate another vector to put into the vector of vectors, then you just write std move in order to reuse the resources of that vector and stick it into the vector of vectors. So you don't have to do a reallocation which is good. Now, there is another purpose of our value semantics. And I, I think maybe it come, came afterwards, maybe a little bit by accident. Um, that's managing lifetime. So in C++11 already, they had still CREF to encapsulate a reference. And then they said, well, if that reference is an R value, like a, a, some, some temporary, then that reference is not going to live very long. So we are scared, and we are not going to allow creating a CREF from an R value. We only allow L value references. And then C++20 ranges came along and said, well, we have these range adapters. Uh, here it's a filter. And these filters are evaluated lazily, if you're not familiar with it. So you're, you have some container, and you, you attach a filter to it. That means the filter doesn't get executed right away. It just Basically, the filter just stores a reference to that vector, and when then you ask that filter for elements, it will then start filtering the vector. And that reference is, is also a reference. It's stored by reference inside that filter. And if you would write something like this, and it would compile, then that std vector that you created would go out of scope by the time you start using your filter, and that wouldn't go very well. So they said, well, we're not going to make this compile. We're just going to disallow this. Uh, and there, they also start and say, OK, we do some reasoning based on the fact that this is an R value. Now, before we go into the lifetime aspect, let's talk a little bit about the moving of, uh, aspect of R values, because there are a few pitfalls that you may or may not know. And well, after the talk, you're going to know them. So let's say we have this, OK? We have a variable A that's const. And we return std move. What happens? So hands up if you think it gets moved. Hands up if you think it doesn't get moved. Hands up if you are not so sure. <laughs> okay, these are the, that's the majority. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So that's it's good that we do this. Um, so no, it doesn't get moved. Why doesn't it get moved? Because you cannot move out of a const. And helpfully, stip move doesn't tell you that. It just says, oh, it looks like, looks like stip move, but well, it, it doesn't really move. So let's remove the const. Does it now move? Well, yes, it does, because um, I removed the const, so that's good. But the question is, is that the best we can do? Who thinks it's the best we can do? Who thinks it's not the best we can do? Well, okay. So what shall we do? 
we shall just remove the std move. Um, what happens now? What you're getting is what's called named return value optimization. So the copying and moving is not necessary anymore because the compiler figures out where to put this A so it's in the spot of your return value. Under the hood, the, the, the function gets basically a place where you say, oh, please put your return value there. And then the compiler, when it's just generating code, is just putting that variable that you return at that very spot, so you don't need to do anything to move it out. It's, it's already in the right place. All right. What happens if you put a const in front of the, uh, with the A? Hmm. Where do you think it gets moved still? Okay, one person, it still gets moved. It's named return value optimization. Named return value optimization doesn't care about const. It's very intuitive, right? Um, okay, so we do the same thing, but just introduce some ifs. So we now have two branches. One returns one kind of A, the other returns another kind of A. What happens now? Hmm, the problem is this return value optimization doesn't work in this case. Because, as I said, it works by the compiler putting that return value into the right spot. Now, in this case, you have two variables. And the compiler doesn't do any reasoning whether these things are alive at the same time. It just says, well, there are two now this guy is returning, two distinct variables. I don't know which one to put where. And so it won't do any new ret uh, named return value optimization. And again, it will do a copy because A is const. So we have to improve that by removing the const, and then at least you get a move, which is already more efficient than what you usually, than your, than your copy. Okay. Now, let's have another case. We have a structure that contains an A. Structure B contains an A. And you are instantiating the B that contains the A, but you're only returning the A. Hmm. Looks very similar to that guy, right? You have an A and you turn the A, now you have a B and you return the B M A. Hmm. Well, but you don't get a move in this case. You cannot get a named return value optimization because this, this B there may be bigger, right? You can't place it in the place where you want your return value to go. So that won't work. But at least you would have thought, well, why, why can't I get a move? Well, no, you don't get a move. Because the, the, when they... Um, when you have this member access, then they don't automatically become, become our values uh, if they are returned. But, interestingly, when you move the B, it's enough to make that access to MA also an R value reference. So that's good, right? So there we actually do get the move. You don't have to write the move around the, the BMA. Um, and it's kind of like truthful to write it around the B because the B is really what's going away now. So, like, take that. You are going away. You know, all the consequences should now happen. In that case, this works. Okay. So, what do we learn? Uh, first of all, I think return values should ne variables should never be const. Right? If you if you write them, you think you get your named return value optimization, and later on you put in another branch, you just pessimized your program. You just threw away your move. Um, so my rule is return value variables are never const, so that they can be moved out. Um, there is also, Clang has a warning, uh, wm move, that uh, will call out any pessimizing moves. So if you just put the move everywhere, it will say, oh no, don't put that move there, uh, you're making it worse. You're just disabled named return value optimization, or even return value optimization. Okay, here's another idiosyncrasy of the language, the, uh, the temporary lifetime extension. So let's say I have, again, a B, and, that, and inside that B lives an A, and I have an accessor this time uh, that returns the A by, by reference. And so I have a B, and then from that B I get the A. And that's, that gets returned by reference, and then stored, that reference gets stored in the A. Okay, so far, so nothing special. Let's say we have a similar structure C that also has a get A, 
but this time the get A returns by value. And then we have generic code. We all like generic code, right? They're just called get A, and we want to store what we are getting somewhere. So, and in this case, it's uh, you're storing it in this reference. It's like, well, does this work? Who do you think this works? Uh, who thinks this works? <laughs> okay, it looks like a dangling reference, right? Because you are returning a value and you're storing it in a reference. And it looks weird. It doesn't look good. Well, there is this special rule called temporary lifetime extension that makes this work. So the compiler looks at what's coming back from this get A, this temporary, and says, ooh, this gets stored in a variable, that reference. Let's extend its lifetime. Let's not go, let's let it go out of scope, but let's, let's let it live until the end of the scope of the reference. And then it will just only at the very end of the function it will actually get destroyed. So this actually works. And the idea was nice, and that predates our value references. Um, this predates a lot of things. This has been around for a long time. Um, the idea is, okay, you can always write kind of auto constref, constref something, and irrespective of what the function gives you back, whether it's a value or a reference, automatically the right thing happens. Nice idea. Does it work? Well, not so much. So let's say we have these, these A's are less comparable, okay? And we are now calling, uh, we, we're now again having a function, uh, get A, that returns you an, an, a value of A. And this time we're just not storing that value of A. Instead, we have two A's and we want to store the minimum of the two. Quite natural, right? So you're running stidmin uh, of get A, C1 get A and C2 get A. And you store that in your reference. Looks very much like what we had before, right? The autoconst A got stored down there, B or C, get A. Ah, now we have a step mid in between. How bad can that be? Well, very bad. You look at the implementation of step mid. So it takes two things by const reference and then gives, returns one of these two. And as you can see, Stidmin conveniently forgets about the R value in, in the process. So it doesn't know anymore whether things used to be a value or used to be a reference or what it was. It's at the end always a const reference. And that const reference then gets assigned to the A and the compiler doesn't have any, any way to make that temporary live longer because there's no temporary. There's just a reference for the compiler. And so A will dangle. Now, how can we fix this? Um, there, there are a, a more than one problem. There's more than one problem here. The first problem is that we forget about the R valueness, right? So this we, we really have to change. So let's make this now in vain of C++ 11, let's make this a forwarding function. We take these things by universal reference and forward one of the two. And that means that if, um, and, and, Yes, they have to agree now on their R value units. That's, that's still a little bit of a problem here. But if they do, right, if these two are compatible as far as their return value is concerned, then you would actually get the right thing. If you plug in two R values, then you'll get an R value out. So now we are, so the, the, our implementation of min correctly returns an R value reference of A. So we at least have a chance now to do things right because we know that things, things are in trouble. The problem is A still dangles because this temporary lifetime extension only can extend the lifetime of temporaries, which are PR values, actual values which are generated on the spot right there. If they are receiving an R value reference, which is still a pointer to somewhere else, it can't really do anything. So it doesn't, ex and it doesn't create a copy silently. If there's no temporary, there's no temporary lifetime to extend, it doesn't do anything. No copy here. All right, so that's, that's not good, right? Um, here's another thing that's troublesome. You have a function A that returns, some A that returns an A, and, and uh, you have another function that may also return a const ref. So you have one of the two. And you want to, again, write generic code that just passes on whatever you get from some A. 
if you get an L value reference, return an L value reference. If you get an R value reference, you return an R value. If you return a value, you return a value. And this works fine if you just say decal type auto foo returns some A. Works OK. Now, let's see. If you have some A, um, but, uh, and before you return it, you want to do something else. So you want to store that in a variable. The question is, how does that variable look like? And is, is what, what's temporary lifetime extension going to do for you, to do for us here? So let's try it. So let's store it, the auto construct, in some A. The auto construct uh, A, in both cases, if you return a value or if you return a reference, will still, uh, will still store a valid value. It will not dangle. It will live. The problem comes when you return A. Because this decal type auto will return the declaration type of A. And, and the compiler is really lying because a temporary lifetime extension here, whoops, where do we have this? So the temporary lifetime extension of this A will say, oh, I'm a, I'm a reference. It will always say I'm a reference. Const ref, that's what, I, that's what it's declared at. It, it doesn't know anything about the, the language, it doesn't know about the, the temporary lifetime extension. So it'll say, well, what am I going to return? I'm going to return a const reference, and it will dangle. Now, if you change the uh, decal type auto for an auto, it doesn't get any, any better because then you always return a value. The auto produces always a value, so you don't get your efficiency that you wanted. Hmm. So the, 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 the real core problem is that this temporary lifetime extension lies about what it really is. If, if you get a temporary lifetime extension, you really have a value in your hand. You don't have reference anymore. And you should reason about it when you, when you do things on this type. You should reason about it just like what you would do with a value, not with a reference. But this is not what's happening here. It's still a, a reference, although it is holding a value. And then things go wrong. So really, the, the, the reasoning that decal type auto does about the qualities of A are wrong, because A is, a is lying. A is, a is saying, I'm a reference. So what do we do about that? Um, I would say deprecate lifetime, temporary lifetime extension. Don't use it. Temporary lifetime extension is bad because we are now in C++ with more and more modern C++. We reason about types. Types are important. And we ask variables, what, what's your type? And then we do things with that type. And if that type's lying to you, if it's telling you something that's not true, then, then bad things happen. So we, we don't want that anymore. Now, what we ideally want is a variable that it's really auto, if you construct it either from a value, then you store a value, or from an R value reference. If you write decal type auto, it will store an R value reference if you get an R value reference. So that doesn't solve the problem quite, because you also want probably to copy when you receive an R value reference. That was that SID min example, where we read it, or our min example, where we return an R value reference. You want to store that by value. And you want auto construct if it's constructed from an L value reference. I have no better way to do this than with a macro. So we have this auto CREF macro um, that just decides, OK, look at the value of your, of your expression. And then based on its, its type, we basically decide, OK, we either take now a value or we take this thing by L value reference. And R value references we put into this value bucket and, and return, uh, we return uh, or store it by value if you want to look at it real quick. So there is basically the L value case. And then if you get an R value, um, you, you, the, your type is the decayed version. OK. Now uh, let's try it with that. So if you have an auto CREF, A sum A, now it will store it either by value or by R value reference. And then if you return it, it will actually return by value or by L value reference. So no R value reference is dangling anymore. And uh, yeah. Keep in mind, no parentheses there. If you put parentheses there, it's the expression type. It's not the declaration type. And that will produce a reference. So if you put parentheses around the A, the type of this expression is a reference, an L value reference. It's not, OK, not a value. Um, we make this our default auto. We don't use auto, auto, construct, blah, blah, blah. We just use our macro. Um, and it also works if your expression contains lambdas, but you need C++20 for that. Then your, your decal type will also work with lambdas. Um, there's one choice we can make. We can either um, say, OK, this value that we store is always non-const. It's, it's always a value. 
without const. Um, or we can say, well, this really doesn't mimic the semantics of auto constref because auto constref is const. So you could say, well, maybe we make two different versions of this auto ref. One when we uh, want to return it, then we say, oh, it's it's notionally const still, but we want to return it later. And for return, we must not make values const because otherwise the move doesn't work. So that's why we have this auto ref return. Not terribly pretty. Um, and, but in the default case, auto ref, we just make the value const, just so that you have similar semantics for the, for the const ref and the, and the, value, uh, the value case. OK. Um, now, with that tool in place, lo and behold, uh, our, our min also works. So with this our min, we solve this problem that we are now passing out the R value reference. And with the auto ref, now that R value reference gets valuified when it gets assigned to a variable, and then the, uh, then the whole thing works. So we now auto ref A with our min C get A, C2 get A works. Good. OK. Um, let's get to something else. Let's look at this. Again, we have our A and the B that contains an A. Uh, and now we assign the MA to A, and our B in this case is a temporary. Does this work? Well, yes, it does. Because the B is an R value. It's a, it's a, a temporary. You just created it. And then when you access the member of R values, you again get an R value. And the auto C ref will then store that R value by value. So everything is fine in this case. OK, that's what I just said. Now let's look at this um, if we put in an accessor for the A. And usually we write accessors like this, right? So we write just a const function that returns the constant reference to MA. And there are many accessors out there that we write all the time. And now we try to store our get A in an A, and B is an R value. This does not work. Because the B is an R value, but the get A of that B gets called also on R values. It's not restricted. If you write a const function, const member function, you can call this if your class, if your, your type, if your object is an R value. It will still run. And it will return a constant reference. It will just simply forget about it being an R value. So, And the, the fundamental problem here is in C++, if you write constref, it binds to everything. It binds to R values, to L values, mutable, non-mutable, it will just bind. And in the process, it will forget that it was an R value, which is bad. I think that's a fundamental flaw in the language. Uh, and, and it's actually something that I call R value amnesia. C++ forgets about R values. And People have noticed this problem in places, interestingly enough. So let's say we have this ternary operator here. Um, one where we call it on with two uh, arguments with two L values. And once we call it with two R values, one L values, one R values. Now, you would expect if you call it with two L values, the ternary operator will give you out an L value, which it does. If you call it with two R values, it gives you out, a, it returns a R value reference, which it does. That works. Now, of course, there's the interesting case. What if you mix the two? If an R value reference and an L value reference, what's going to be the result? Who do you think it's an L value? It's an L value. Who thinks it's an R value? Who thinks it's somewhat, something else? It does compile. It does compile. The type is a const, of course. Clear, right? A const. Because they somehow like, oh my god, we have to do something. Oh, we make it a const ref. What do we do with a lifetime? Oh my, no, we get gang dangling. Uh, uh, okay, let's make it a value. Let's copy it, this thing. It's, it's, that's, that's safe. It's okay. So C++ in this case forces a copy. You just always get, get a PR value. 
Huh. And then there is common reference. This is a C++20 invention that was originally built if you have two iterators and they return different references. And now you put these two iterators together, for example, in some sort of union range. You merge them together. And now you need a reference that represents both, in a way, that, 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 can, that can bind to both of these. That's what common reference was built for. So what does it do? You'd expect it does the same thing. So the common reference, again, of acons reference, acons reference, is acons reference. Same with R values, R, R, R value references. Still stays the same, all good. But what's this? A const reference. So it digs into the R value amnesia. It, it says, ah, yeah, whatever. It binds, right? It binds. It's okay. All fine. All good. What's this? Uh, it's a value. Maybe it's a, the value is not that different from an R value reference, but who knows? What's an A? The const is, you don't need the const. But okay, maybe. I mean, value is what, 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 what's con why? If you copy from a const, why is your re result const? So it's not const. No, it's A. All right. So common reference really likes R value amnesia. Um, so now the question is what's correct? We want to know, I mean, I told you all these things that are broken. What is, what is the fundamental problem that we're having here? And, and how do we fix it? So, let's look at what references, what references promise. So when I have a, have a reference, what do I think about that reference? What can I do with that reference? So, one thing is the lifetime. You have either have a short lifetime, that, that's an R value, it'll go out of scope very soon, and then there's a long lifetime for L values, longer lifetime. And then you have mutability. They're either immutable or they're mutable. And then you could add that little property on the R value reference that you can scavenge. That, that you assume that if it's mutable and if it goes away very soon, then you can steal its values. So that also probably shouldn't fall from the sky. So, and this is what C++ is doing. This is the bind these are the binding rules of C++. So everything binds to constref. And, okay, the, the mutable ones bind to the const ones, that's okay, but not vice versa, that's good. But you can see it's violating the, the lifetime constraint. So the, the lifetime comes from, from something that has short lifetime, suddenly has a long lifetime. It just gets, just gets by, by binding it to a constref, uh, you, can, you can extend the, 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 the felt lifetime of this thing. It suddenly gives you a bigger promise than it really can, can fulfill. And you can kind of already see how you should fix this, right? Just turn some arrows around. This is how it should be. So now you have the const R value reference is the one that everyone binds to because it's, it promises short lifetime and, and it's const. So it's kind of the weakest of all of them. And, and then everything kind of happens accordingly, right? So this can scavenge will just prevent the L value reference to bind to the R value reference. Because yes, it is mutable, but the problem is that someone will take its values away. And then the L value reference is gonna be naked. And, and that, that's probably not good. So that's why you don't want this arrow. Um, but other than that, that's, that's what it is. So you only bind when you have less lifetime, less mutability, less scavengeability, if you want. Um, and you can see that only L values should really bind to constref, because constref is an L value. And constref ref is now the new constref, basically. Hmm. It's a bit strange, because it get, gets, gets something to be used. <sighs> and it's so sad. Oh, we, we broke it. It's, 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 been, it's been kind of it's broken since the standard got invented. You know, what are you going to do? <laughs> the world could have been nice, but it's not. So, is there any chance to fix it? And this is, is very hypothetical, okay? So far, I mean, I, I think I've, I found no problem with it to do it that way. But maybe one of you come up, comes up with a problem why you can't do this, okay? And I haven't implemented it, it's just an idea. It's like, okay, if you, if you put up a problem, if you say, oh my God, everything's broken, then you kind of are obliged to show a path forward and say, oh, well, this may be how we can fix it. Um, 
And there are some prerequisites, right? So we can't break existing code. Um, it must continue to work. Otherwise, well, all the other developers will, will hate us. Um, and we also have to be able to mix and match. We have to take existing libraries and just put them into our, you know, our newfangled system, and it has to work. So um, we have to be able to mix them in one code base. So here's the idea. Um, we say, well, any reference either binds according to the new rules or to the old rules. And since the binding of that reference only happens at the beginning of the lifetime of the reference, it, this is kind of nice because then we can say, well, once that decision is made, once this thing is bound, that, that reference will live, keep living according to its rules. There's no, there's no like, like, you know, um, uh, long distance influence of anything. Once the, once the type is set, the type is set. And then it will work according to the rules. Only when the, the new binding is happening, there is a new reference to be, to be created. Then again, we have the choice. Okay, what are we going to do? How, which rules are applying? Um, and I said, well, we, we do a pragma. We just switch off, switch on and off the, the, the new binding rules. We would just say, well, if there's an auto construct A, then the old rules apply. And you can switch on the reference binding. You switch a new, new reference binding. Then the new rules apply. And if you want to switch it back off, the old rules apply. So you can switch it up, on and off. So you kind of have like in your, in your include headers, you would somewhere where you would have, okay, new binding rules. And then your file is written according to the new rules. Um, so in order to jog your imagination a little bit, where do these bindings occur, or do these reference declarations occur? Where do they come about? Um, so that we know like, like what's influenced by that, by that pragma that we introduced. So you have, of course, local global variables. Um, you have structured binding. There you could create references. You have parameter lists, um, and for functions and for lambdas. Then you can initialize members in POD. Uh, now there's also named initialization, if, but that's basically, basically the same thing. Same problems, rules, what apply. Um, you have members that are initialized in constructors, and you have lambda captures. These are the only, the, all the things that I came up with where C++ is essentially instantiating a reference. And in all these cases, these, this new rule versus old rule would apply. So here's an example. Uh, say I'm, I'm declaring A in const reference A. Now I say, okay, new reference binding is on, and then I'm declaring a B and a C. Um, if I'm now defining B, and I have a different reference binding enabled, the compiler would complain and say, no, you, you decided that, that B should follow these set of rules. Now you're supposed to follow that set of rules. That can't be. The reference, the, the, the type of binding has to, be, has to agree. And then when you use it, uh, the A5 compiles, right, because the 5 binds to the int const ref. For the B, um, it would not work because it is new binding rules and it's an L value reference, so it, it doesn't bind. The, you have the, the PR value 5 doesn't bind. But the in const ref ref would actually bind because um, it, it would compile because, um, well, it's an it's a, uh, R value const. That's our weakest reference. And um, unlike in, in uh, the current C++, the bottom would also compile. So if you have an int A1 and then call CA, it will also bind to your const R value reference, which there's no reason it should not. OK, well, but say, well, what are the other impacts that this idea would have? And, and maybe it's not exhaustive, but I thought a little bit about, OK, what's, what's the problem with the standard library? Um, the, any functions are usually pretty easy to re-implement using these new rules. Essentially, your const reference would be your, the, the, the const R value reference would be the new const reference. So whenever you're typing, oh, I want to take things here by, ju just look at it, read only, don't want to copy anything, you just type const ref ref. Big search and replace. Um, in the type traits, there would be, I, I looked through the type traits, and they are pretty much then unchanged uh, uh, besides the common reference, which would then have to make the right choices. Um, but essentially, when you do const ref, const ref ref, you get a const ref ref. Okay, this is all very hypothetical. And uh, the question is, what can we do now in our everyday programming to mitigate this problem somehow? 
And here are some mitigations that we use in our code uh, to deal with this problem. Um, first of all, we do use auto CREF. I already showed it to you to get around the temporary lifetime extension. Um, we do have a bunch of macros for member accessors, so we don't write these accessors just with a constref. Um, but instead, we just delete the R value accessors. Most of the time, that's why you know, code works most of the time, you don't need member accessors for R values. So we just say, OK, um, we'll, we'll just you know, um, delete the R value uh, accessor for now so that we, you, so you can't accidentally access anything um, if the, your, your object is going out of scope or is soon to go out of scope. Um, then we have our own common reference. Um, here, you, the idea is simply, OK, you just calculate the common reference. And if one of the things that you passed to this common reference is an R value, then you just demote whatever you're getting back to an R value. So that's, that's pretty simple. Um, here's another one. We had this, this decal type of this false uh, or this, this ternary operator with, where we mix right and left, uh, not right and left, uh, where we mix R value and L value. And, and there the result was a const, and we couldn't kind of not really fi figure out why. Um, and you can fix that. Once you have a fixed common reference, you can now also implement this as a macro. And basically, before you um, evaluate that ternary operator, you turn your arguments into the right reference types. So you calculate your common reference, which would then say, OK, this is an R value reference in the above case. So you, the, 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 R, the uh, R value and L value um, uh, mixture, then you would get an R value const, const reference, a const R value reference. Um, and then with, with that, you could actually feed that into the ternary operator. And, and, and then the ternary operator does the right thing. So that's, that's something you can do. So that will basically replace all your ternary operators. Now, this works. As I said, um, you now get an A const R value reference. And there's no copy anymore, because you casted it before um, to the appropriate reference types. All right, so uh, here's the summary. So I, I think the const L value reference, uh, they made the life very easy to make it bind everything. It probably shouldn't have bound to everything. It should, be have, should have been restricted to L values. Um, that would have made a little bit the hoop a little bit larger to go into the C++ 11 um, uh, uh, world, but it would have saved us from some grief. Um, fixing C++ is maybe possible, but I mean we would need an implementation and a large code base to try this all on. Whether whether this is actually a good idea, uh, and until then we just uh, have mitigations that we can use in our code. All right, thank you very much. Ooh. I think we have time for questions. I know we have questions. Um, when you say constref should never bound to R values, you probably mean X values, because for PR values, I think it should still be fine. Uh, well, outside of temporary lifetime extension, no. I mean, if you have temporary lifetime extension, then it, it would have been OK. Um, is it going to be okay in all circumstances? I mean, yes, with X values, you're certainly you're certainly in trouble. If the, the, the yeah. R value is a reference, then you are but, in trouble. But my understanding um, was the constref lifetime extension for PR values is not something that needs fixing. Also, I didn't see that from from your presentation. Well, well, except that it's lying about the type. Except that when you return this thing and you have decal type auto, then suddenly your temporary lifetime extension turns into an actual L value reference. So, so there is still a problem. So, so your, your, your value doesn't get lost. OK, that's good. But when you then inspect the type of that, of that variable, it will tell you L value reference. And then anything that does a reasoning about that type will break. Certainly see that with the ref, const ref qualifier you had on the member function. Um, there, if you have the pure R value, like you, you, inst you created an A and then uh, called the member function get a or created a b and called get a that should not like take the const ref qualified one which is why you deleted the const ref ref one 
um, in order to get rid of that. And, and I see that the PR value turning into const ref is a problem here. Yeah. This will break. Yeah. So you, there you have, the, you have your, some A produces a PR value. You store it in your A, and now you return the A, and you have declared full decal type auto. Well, this will break. Because your, yeah. your, your, PR, your temporary lifetime extension says, I'm, a, I'm an L right. value reference, I'm yes. cool. I can be returned by reference, but nope. Uh, sure. Sure. And and my other uh, like comment, the real problem is like references. Let's say again. References are the problem. If it were all just values that we can work with, and it were more efficient, how values can be passed around and would not always lead to copies. But it's a different language. <laughs> yeah, it's a different language. I mean, I, and and that's I think. Uh, um, uh, if, if you, I know that there is the val language out there, and uh, some people love the val language. And then there is the carbon language, which made different choices. And I think they they rather say, okay, I'm not going to go through the complication of making everything a value. And and the, the problem is really not that bad. Um, I after consideration, some consideration, I would probably be more in the carbon camp. They are still they are still making very I think very good choices regarding in particular regarding passing things. By, by reference, um, so if you this this uh, this whole idea that you always say, okay, I'm g getting past something, let's take it by constref, right? That, that's also not not necessarily efficient. You may want to pass things by value, and um, and then it's interesting that you are that you can't take in carbon, then don't doesn't let you take the the, the address of that of that argument, um, which eliminates all kinds of aliasing problems. Um, so I, I think they, they, can we write a different language that's better? Yes, sir, certainly we can. And there are various choices to make. Um, but uh, for C++, this, this came, actually, this was more a practical problem. I mean, we ran into, into this situation in our practical code. And then we kind of started thinking, OK, why does this happen? What's really the underlying problem here? And then we came up with these mitigations and so on. So it's it's really something that affected us as a programmer. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, the the problem at the end is that you have a dangling reference or a dangling pointer. In this case, it's a dangling reference, and when you go out, you can access something that uh, a, a class that doesn't exist. Actually, shouldn't be better if there is so high risk to use, for example, a shared pointer or something similar, because you have a, kind of a shared pointer, for example, for this classy. Oh, like sh smart, uh, sh so shared, shared pointer. Shared pointer. Yes, shared pointer. Yeah, um, because you well, have a, when you go out of spoke, if someone still have a reference, you have a, count, a counter, uh, and at, at the, the end, cost, it would, yeah. At the cost of efficiency, you can always make you know, a lot of things safe. At the end, you know, be Java, and you use a garbage collector, and, and then never anything is, and no one, nothing is ever dangling, right? But this all costs <laughs> performance. I mean, this is not what we want to do when we write C++. We want to do, when we want to write C++, we really want to get to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the bare metal, and we want to get the performance from that bare metal. And I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting endeavor to find out what can you do with this bare metal that is still theoretically sound and safe? Like, mm -hmm. and, and how, how can you devise a language that gives you that power, but at the same time where you don't shoot yourself in the foot and, and where, where things kind of stay sane? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, they, I mean, that, that's what Carbon and Val are, are kind of trying to do, is trying to do research, okay, how does such a language have to look like? And, and, and what are all the lessons that we learned with, with you know, things with, with languages mainly like C++? Yeah, but the, actually the, the loss in efficiency is just when you are allocating in the heap, it's a little bit worse than allocating in the stack. But you are actually, the, to having, if, if a class normally is big, just having a small uh, integer pointer that is counting up and down is inefficiency. I mean, because if the problem is that you have here a mean, or you are doing a simple function like mean or max, or you can end up you are you have bad luck with a with a dangling reference and your code will break in the, in the, in the in, would break in that situation. I, I think that. in many in many situations the performance will matter uh, mm -hmm. and and um, and there's not for nothing that people you know write their programs in C plus plus and not in Java. Um, so I, I, it's I think very few um, C plus plus programmers would start writing everything you know with shared pointers just because of this problem. Yes. Um, it, it, they would probably just stick to values and um, and 
and, and, work, and work around or, or say, okay, maybe it's my fault if I make this mistake. And, and it's, of course, the const reference binds to everything. Um, I, I should have known. Um, but but I, I think there's, there's a flaw. Uh, is, it, is it so bad that we all have to switch to Java? No, I probably, I mean, I'm still writing some no. okay. Thanks. Java, really? Lo I saw lots of people going to Java and coming back to C++. <laughs> First thing. Uh, second thing, I, I declare uh, as, an, as a goal in my life to get rid of any share pointer in any application. <laughs> it's always a bad idea. Rem remember this, share pointer is always a bad idea. Most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, uh, thank you very much for a great presentation, very interesting uh, topic. Um, uh, do you th uh, think about uh, turning this uh, rule uh, choose uh, a compiler uh, option, or because I, I, I mean, I'm not going to hack. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to hack Clang to make it happen. <laughs> I mean, we have, uh, we have. Um, I, I think my hope would maybe at this point more that that languages like Carbon uh, get traction. And that then you know we can we can move on from C++ because they are probably I mean uh, let's be real I mean right, there are many other flaws and and I think the race has not been made but eventually probably someone will is going to turn out as a winner uh, and you know there's 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 Rust and there's Carbon and there's Val and there's there are all these languages that that kind of aspire to be the the follow-up language to C++ and and maybe at some point someone's going to win yeah and uh, and then. Hopefully the world's a better place. Let's see what that what what that language then has as flaws. So we'll see. So, but, but my, my question is more like uh, I I see more or less, or I I, I kind of, of think about it. Uh, the reason behind the uh, putting the macro for uh, choosing uh, all all rules or new rules, but uh, in the end that will uh, uh, hold a problem for maintainability and readability of the code because. When I use a function, I I need to know if that function uses the old rules, new rules, uh, or something like that. And that uh, that the the reason I asked about the uh, compiler uh, mm -hmm. flag because uh, when you compile, you, 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 you choose uh, no, no, okay, it's my all my code base is going to uh, compile with the new rules, and I'm happy about that. I I think this um, I mean. You, you could make it a compiler flag. The, the problem with it being a compiler flag is that you have to convert all your code at the same time, yeah. which is probably unrealistic. Yeah. So that, that's that's why. And, and then I, and I thought, okay, can we can we somehow you know change the syntax of this kind of binding and that kind of binding, and and I could kind of mold these different options, and and that's the best I could come up with. But I mean, there are certainly other solutions, and um, I'm, I'm happy to discuss them. I, I haven't implemented any of it, so I can, can't really claim that that's you know the, the wisest choice. Let, let me show an idea. What, what about just integrating it in a, in a coding standard and having an analyzer to check this for you? I mean, it's easier than hacking the compiler. Uh, you don't need a new version of the language. You don't need a new compiler. Mm -hmm. And you still can achieve it. Hopefully, then, the I mean, you are... Um, Hopefully, your analyzer will figure out any of the dangling pointers you could potentially generate. I mean, if you pass this down far enough, then I don't know if they if they'll. My my experience with with static analysis is mixed at best. Um, I had it was a vendor coming to us and they ran it over our code and they found uh, ten thousand false positives and and one real bug, and and that. Doesn't, didn't make me think, and they spent a lot. I mean, they want a lot of money for that tool, and and they, I, I'm not sure whether that there's really that the state of the art there. That I, I'm 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 kind of thinking that when you have a when when your static analyzer points out, what what are these things good at? They are really good at you know pointing out all these dangling pointers. And what's and, and what's the problem? Well, the problem is not that you use the the pointers in the wrong way. The 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 problem is that you're using pointers, period. Uh, in my eyes, so you know, just yeah. If you if you don't pair up your malloc and freeze, but I mean, don't don't do malloc and freeze. I mean, that, that's. Uh, I wasn't meaning a static analyzer. Uh -huh. I was meaning adding additional rules in a coding standard and having a tool to ensure you follow the rules, okay. which is a, a different thing. 
simpler to implement mm -hmm. and allows static ana uh, allows local analysis and not global analysis. Yeah, maybe I'm not. I think I'm not good enough for these writing these tools and I'm not a language guy. So, um, hi. I, I don't really know whether this is doable, but have you thought about the possibility of using some sort of reference wrapper and then see that in order to implement your new binary rules? That could work, maybe? Yeah. Um, the, I, I think the, the biggest problem... Well, the, the, the problem, biggest problem is with you, that, you and, and, Yeah, th there, is, there is this problem um, with... Uh, and, and that creeps up also in C++ all over the place is that when you're writing a template, you need to be able to do the template deduction. So if you have a reference wrapper yeah. um, and you have to define the type of that reference wrapper just by reference deduction. No, but, and, and but CTAT basically allows you to not do that. You know? But not if I use it in a parameter list. So if you put it in a... So you, you want... Say yeah, I want a reference, a, an arbitrary ref. I want to take an arbitrary reference yeah. in an ar in a in a in a. Uh, so let's say you have a special reference wrapper of T. You see in C tab, you basically can omit the T there, and then use the guideline. The guide. Uh, I don't remember yeah, yeah. the name. But the it, construction but if, if guideline. I don't know whether it, this works. Maybe, maybe there is a similar problem. I mean, the, this problem is actually good. It's, it's, if it would be solvable, I think we would we would make more people happy. Um, when you are using std span, for example, yeah. and you want to have a std span of t, yeah. um, then saying, okay, I want to be able to pass in all kinds of things which are representable as a span t, and I don't think you can write that in a, in in C plus uh, plus. There. You, you cannot say, oh, my, 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 uh, my vector is a span t, vector t is a span t, and my basic string t is a span t, and my whatever is a span t, and then I'm just writing, you know, std span t, template parameter, and that, and, and that template parameter will automatically be, derived, be, de de be uh, de deduced. Uh, that, that's, uh, and, and, and this will kind of be the similar problem. And I think it's a frequent problem. That this, I mean, it's another flaw in the language that you are, that you are, how this, how these template parameters get calculated. You would like to do this kind of programmatically. You would like to say, okay, I'm receiving this particular type. Now, in my argument, for example, in my, I, I want to match this particular type. How do I calculate what's the type that I, I want to, you know, want to bind it to? And, and that, that calculation isn't, at least for, yes, for CTAT, you, you can do it. Then there it's, it's, uh, it's easier. Um, I, but I think, think for parameter lists that that problem hasn't been solved in, in if you have a function parameter list. Okay, thank you. Any, uh. I just want to make uh, some uh, short remark that if you really like C++ and you really think that this is a disaster, you can switch back to C++ 98. <laughs> okay. Point. Any other question? So thank you very much. All right. <laughs>